family. Good morning. Hi, we're so glad you're here joining us. My name is Taya. I'm Julie. And we head up the children's ministry here at North County Church of Christ. That's right, we do. So we hope that you guys have been having a good week. How was your week? I had a good week, Julie. Thank you for asking. No problem. Hung out with the kids around the house. Good. It was quite exciting. That's great. <laughs> Much more exciting than watching my kids sleep till 2 in the afternoon. Oh, yeah. it happens because he's a teenager. Yeah, it does. Yes. It does. <laughs> At any rate, now we're going to sing some songs of praise with our praise team. And after that, we're going to have a great lesson from Kevin. So after Kevin's message, we'll come back around. Um, we have a little bit more information for you, so stick around and we'll see you in a bit.
Hello, welcome to North County Church, our online message and time of praise. Hope that the music, the songs really uplifted your spirit. You were able to sing along to them and express your own praise to our God this morning. I hope they drew you closer to Christ. So thankful for Tasha and her team. We're going to continue our series this morning, Living Confidently in Uncertain Times. And I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. We're going to be looking at verse 11 down to verse 14 this morning. But you might want to have a pen or pencil at the ready and a piece of paper to jot down some scriptures because I'm going to move through a number of scriptures, maybe a little more quickly than I normally might. And I'd love for you to have some notes to look at later and to consider some of the things that we're uh, saying. A couple of years back, a number of years back, one of the news outlets ran a story on cool houses to live in. Many of them had been uh, renovated uh, significantly. In the story, there was one house in Dallas, Texas. It was a, quote, converted church. So once a church building, now it was somebody's residence. And according to the realtor, that they interviewed on this particular program, he said, these are his words, desanctified churches were at the time it was built the number one type of building converted to residential use. Kind of a sad commentary, is it not? In, in this particular church building, now house, what they once had as an altar was adapted for use as granite for a beautiful kitchen. The choir loft was rewired for home theater. The place where the baptistry was, well, there was now a soaking tub. The home had a game room, a music room, an exercise studio. The 15,000 square foot former church building, now house, has 11 bedrooms. So I heard that and I thought, I guess folks there can sleep comfortably now that the church has been, quote, converted. Now, as a preacher, I know that some people have always slept in church, some literally so, and some spiritually. And Paul's going to address that here in just a couple of moments. Our series, Living Confidently in Uncertain Times, is a series that's designed to help us not merely survive the times that we're living in, but to spiritually thrive in the midst of the circumstances we're in. And maybe for some of us, the message that we need to hear today is the message that Paul speaks to the Roman church when Paul said, wake up from your slumber. Or maybe the encouragement that you need this morning is, stay awake. Perhaps we have some Christians who need to be reconverted. And as we look at the landscape spiritually across America, I'm fairly confident we need some churches to be reconverted. So, as we get into Romans chapter 13, we're going to be reading there in just a couple of moments. Let me give you just a little bit of background leading into it. Romans chapters 12 and 13 and 14 has all kinds of very practical information about living for Christ. When you begin Romans chapter 12, he calls Christians in that chapter at the very beginning to offer their bodies as living sacrifices, to hold nothing back, to offer it all to God is our spiritual worship. And as you make your way through the chapter, he tells them to function as a body of believers with dependence on one another, to serve one another, to love sincerely, to hate what's evil, to cling to what is good. He goes on in the chapter to say, don't lack zeal, share with God's people, practice hospitality, don't be proud, be willing to associate with people of low position, love your enemies, don't repay evil for evil, don't take revenge, don't be overtaken by evil, but overcome evil with good. He says, be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone, and if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. Then he moves into chapter 13, and he describes our relationship to government. When it comes to government, he says, let the government do its job. They have been placed in their positions of authority by God himself. 
Be subject to them. Don't rebel. Do what's right. Pay taxes. Give proper respect. When you get down into Romans 13 at verses 9 and 10, the bottom line for all of this is what has always been in the teachings of Jesus. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, and not just your Christian neighbor. Your neighbor. And Paul says there, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So I would encourage you, if, if you want some clear directive on how to live out your faith during this time, during any time, whether the times are uncertain or difficult or just seemingly good times, I'd encourage you to read Romans 12 and 13 and ask yourself, hey, where do I need to apply this particular directive or teaching or this verse or that verse? Because it is one clear directive after another for Christian living. It's not overly complicated. It's not necessarily hard. It is a great practical section of Scripture based on all the rich doctrine and theology in chapters 1 to 11. So in the midst of that very practical section, Paul in Romans chapter 13 says the following beginning at verse 11. He said, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. All right. Let's break this down a bit so that we can really grab hold of what it is that Paul is saying to us and so that we can find strength in our circumstances that we're presently living in as believers. How, how do we understand this passage? How do we apply it in our trying times? Well, I want to begin with this. Number one, we need to understand the present time understand the present time. Let's read that statement again. Paul said, do this. Do what? Carry out all the things that I've called you to. Live loving your neighbor, doing the right things, loving what's good, doing what's good, loving one another. Do all of this understanding the present time. Interesting phrase. He says, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Now, I think it's important before we speak too much about the practical side of this, I think it's important to understand what Paul is referring to when he speaks about the present time. Is he speaking to these Roman Christians who were living in the city of Rome, uh, under Roman governance, well, yes. But was it only those circumstances, that present time? No. Was he speaking to our present time, our current circumstances, living during a time of a world pandemic, living during a time of great political polarization in our country, living at a time uh, when there's a great deal of social unrest? Is he speaking about our present time? What is Paul referring to when he speaks about the present time? Well, our time or their time? Yes. The point that Paul makes that we're going to see in just a couple of moments is he is speaking about whatever time Christians are living in, living out their faith in the present age, the present era or epoch of time, epoch of time, you might say, when it comes to uh, our living. And I'll talk about that in just a couple of moments. Paul tells them to wake up. And he makes an interesting statement. He says, because 
our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Interesting statement. Then he says something very interesting in verse 12. He says, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And then he goes on to say, let us behave decently as in the daytime in the next verse. So, so what does Paul mean when he says the night is nearly over? And, and what is this day that is almost here? And how is our salvation nearer than when we first believed? Are we saved presently, today, fully saved? Or is salvation something yet off in the future? How is it that our salvation is nearer than we first believed? Well, one of the things you'll notice when you read through the New Testament is that Paul and the New Testament writers speak in terms of ages. He does it here in Romans, and he does it elsewhere. So, for example, back in Romans chapter 12 at verse 2, you'll remember Paul said there, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Many of you are very familiar with that passage. Did you know that that, that word world can also be translated age? Paul is saying that this present age is fallen and dark and sinful. The, the present world we live in, in this age, is one dominated by Satan, who is, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the quote, God, little g, God of this age. And Paul is saying we shouldn't be conformed to this age that we're in, but that we should be transformed, changed by the renewing of our mind. You might want to write down Ephesians chapter 1 at verse 21. There Paul talks about the present age and the age to come. The age we're in and the age that has yet to come. So Paul speaks about ages. Back in the Old Testament in the Isaiah prophecy, in chapter 60, a prophecy that we take as messianic, that points toward a new age, a new time. In Isaiah chapter 60, beginning at verse 1, the prophet said, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, verse 2, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but... The Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. So as you read here, the prophet is describing a darkness that is over the earth, a thick darkness. He's, he's describing the age when people are living under sin. There's no savior. There's no redeemer. And those Jews living at that time, they were under sin. And the law, which told them how to live, pointed out that they were sinners and they were under condemnation and wrath. So it's a time, that age of darkness, thick darkness. But as we know, after the darkest part of the night, the hours pass, and the dawn comes. And the dawn arises, says that the Lord will arise upon you, verse 2. So I want you to imagine a night of deep darkness, and suddenly off on the horizon, there is this pinprick of light that begins to rise, and it is so illuminating. It's starting to dispel the darkness as the dawn is now upon them that the nations, not just Jewish people, the nations are drawn to this light that rises. Now when dawn happens and the darkness is being dispelled as it did at the coming of Jesus, one can say that the day is almost here. But there is this overlap between the darkness and the day at dawn. Soon, 
an age is coming when the light will fully be present, the light will be straight overhead and no part of what we see from horizon to horizon will remain dark. But in the meantime, the light has risen. The light has come. That's how Christians understood the age that they were in. And they knew that another age was coming that would be different from the present age. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, this passage helps us to see what the early Christians understood. Uh, similar to Romans chapter 13. And when you read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 at verse 2, Paul said, Know very well, or for you know very well, that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. What is this day of the Lord that Paul is referring to? Well, it's the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the Thessalonian Christians and the Roman Christians are, according to Paul, fully aware. Fully aware of the time that they live in and the time that's coming. Every Christian was taught that Christ was coming back from heaven and that it could be soon. And so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 at verse 2, he's saying it's not going to take you off guard the way some people will be taken off guard. It will take some off guard like a thief who comes in the night. What does a thief do when a thief comes in the night? He doesn't call ahead and say, hey, I'm going to be at your house at 2 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday morning, put all your goods out of the front porch. No, the thief comes and uses the element of surprise and takes people off guard. But... Paul says, not you, believers. You will not be taken off guard like this. And why not? Well, he goes on to explain it at verse 4. He says, but you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of light, children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. This is what Paul's referring to in Romans 13 when he says, take on that armor of light. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Paul talks about some who are in the darkness, still in the darkness. And in the time we live in, there are still those living in the night, where there's darkness and evil and death and, and an age system that's ruled by Satan and his emissaries, sin and death abound in this present age. But Paul is saying that because you have accepted Christ as your Lord, because Jesus rules in your heart, that for you the day has dawned. And as believers in Christ, we're not of the night any longer. We're not in the darkness any longer. We belong to this new day that has dawned. That's what he says. We are not in darkness now, here's the deal. We live in a very dark and evil age. We live in a very dark and sinful time. But that is not the main reality for the believer. If you're a Christian, the day has come. Light has come. Christ has come. You live in the light of Christ. You have received his salvation. You have received his word that illuminates your path and tells you how to live in this present age. And now you live differently. So when we think in terms of the present age that we are now in, this is a time when there is an overlap between the present sinful age and the coming age of righteousness. We live in the overlap of this age and the coming fullness of the kingdom of God. We live in the overlap between mortal life and eternal life. When Jesus came, the long-expected age that the prophets described had arrived 
The light had dawned, the kingdom of God had arrived, and eternal life had arrived. And now we're in this present age where the light has risen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 at verse 11, Paul is talking there about Old Testament events and he says about those Old Testament events that they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the age has come. I'm going to put these scriptures up and you might want to write them down to look at them later. But Paul is saying we have things from that previous age that teach us some things about the age that we're in and they have come to us on whom the end of the ages, or some of your versions say, the culmination of the ages has come. If you look in Colossians chapter 1 at verse 13, it says about God that he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Brought us in, that's a great word. It literally means we have been transferred from one kingdom to another, and we presently live in the kingdom that has come. In Hebrews chapter 9 at verse 26, the writer said that Christ has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And then we have this in Hebrews chapter 6 at verse 5. The writer is actually talking about people that have fallen away, but he says there that we who have tasted of the Holy Spirit, we have tasted the power of the ages to come, or of the coming age. So, the mystery of the kingdom of God in part is that the kingdom has arrived. And the age of sin and pain and death did not fully cease. The age to come, the reign of righteousness, the fullness of the kingdom of God, the new creation, eternal life, all these one day will hold complete sway and there will be no more temptation, no more sin, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more grief, no more death. But the mystery is that they're here now and they're very real. There is this overlap between the fallen age of sin and pain and death and this light that we live in, the present age where Christ is present and real and Lord of our lives. Now, sometimes this seems confusing. I mean, sometimes we believers, we wonder. We're saved. We're redeemed. We have the Holy Spirit. And we're trying to live out this life in Christ. But there is so much evil and so much brokenness around us. And we still have our own internal struggle. And we wonder why still so much brokenness. And Paul says... We need to understand this age that we're in, this overlap. We're saved, but one day we'll experience our salvation in its fullness. We have eternal life now. We'll live forever with God, but our bodies will still die. And in these bodies, we still struggle with temptation and sin. We still stumble. We still grieve when we lose another, but there's a, there's a day coming when our salvation is full, when none of those things will any longer be true. We're redeemed now, presently. We've been redeemed from sin, but we still struggle. And one day, we'll experience the full redemption of our bodies. As a matter of fact, Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 22. He said, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as of the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we're saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. In other words, there's something we hope for a full redemption of our bodies that we haven't experienced yet. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So Paul is saying, Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 8, Paul is saying there's the age that was. Now there's the age we're in. Christ has come. 
He has saved us, redeemed us. By his grace, we stand justified before God, at peace with God, forgiven of all of our sins. We're not going to earn our way to heaven. We're not going to enter the fullness of that kingdom by being good enough. We can never be good enough. We live in this age, though, where we haven't yet experienced fully what's to come. We will, but not yet. But we have the light that they longed for in the previous age. Paul put it this way in his letter to Titus. He said, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Paul says, man, the grace of God that offers salvation, it's here, it's real, it has appeared. It teaches us how to live, to say no to ungodliness, to live these upright godly lives when? In the present age, while we wait. While we wait for that age to come, for the blessed hope, the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Back in 1835, James Montgomery said, With every passing day, we pitch our moving tent a day's march nearer home. And when Paul said our salvation is nearer than when we first believed, every day moving toward that age to come is a day nearer, a day closer, when the fullness of our salvation will be experienced. So, Paul says with that, understanding the present age. You see, it can feel confusing. We can sometimes feel like evil is winning. Evil can be so persistent, it can abound around us. But Paul is saying to us, understanding the present age, verse 11, wake up. Wake up. Or if you're awake, stay awake. Here's what Paul said. He said at verse 11, Do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. When he speaks about the day that's near, the night being almost over, he is describing that overlapping time we're in where the dawn has come, but the darkness is not fully gone. The light is here, but there's still night. Hey, night is passing. The day of that new age is almost here. And so Paul is saying, understanding that, wake up from your slumber. Those of you who might be asleep spiritually, now is the time to come back to life and to live for God and to repent if that's your need. I mean, it's evident, isn't it, that when Paul writes this letter to the church at Rome, there were some who were spiritually asleep. They were in a slumber. What is it that leads us sometimes as Christians to fall asleep spiritually. Well, maybe for you, if you've been asleep spiritually or if you've ever had a period where you've been kind of lulled into a spiritual slumber, think about what it is that leads to that. It could be that you just get into some routines. And Christ is kind of removed out of the picture of your life. You get up and you're busy and you're you're trying to get everybody ready for school or work, and man, you're busy on the job, and you get home and you're tired, and what are we going to eat? And you get dinner done, and you sit down on the couch, and you're just exhausted, and you go to bed a little later, and you get up and you do it all over again, and, and maybe Christ isn't there at the, the burning center of your life. Or it could be that you have become anesthetized to spiritual things by sin that you're tolerating in your life, that you have been harboring in your own life and entertaining in your life, or maybe living out fully, and you want to push the things of God away, you've fallen asleep to the things of God because you're very alive to sin, which really brings death, not life, and you need to repent of those things, wake up from your slumber, and as Paul will go on to say, put those things aside and put on the armor of light. Or it could be that you're just so busy running after the things of this world. You've got goals, man. You've got things you want to achieve, money to be, to be made, accomplishments to be had, and you just don't have time for God in your life right now. Paul is saying, understand the present age, that this is just a temporary period. It's an age. 
there's an age to come. And we're living now, awaiting the age to come, living now, tasting the age to come. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We're alive to Christ. Our sins are forgiven. We're trying to live out now the life of the kingdom because eternity is coming in a new way. A new day will dawn when this age will be over. And we're living here in preparation for that. Paul is saying live fully in this age for that age to come. Not half-heartedly, not in mediocrity, not in lukewarmness. I want to end, and then we're going to come back to this next Sunday in our message. But get, getting a grasp on understanding this age, I think, is critical. Because we often get discouraged in this age by what we see around us. And, and instead, of being, instead of just being shocked, we got to live out our lives in reverent fear, looking for the age to come and helping people, helping people to see the light, to come out of the darkness and to experience the goodness of God themselves while there's still time to do it. This present age won't last forever. But I want to end with a story on this message. DeAndra Leslie Pelikey was a physics professor, or is, at the University of Texas. And she wrote a book about the physics of NASCAR racing. And so, for her research, she was given the opportunity to drive a NASCAR racer on the 1.5 mile track of the Texas Motor Speedway. I have driven by that speedway before. So, with an instructor in the passenger seat, she drove the car at speeds of up to 150 miles an hour. And it was while accelerating to get up to that speed that she learned a very interesting lesson about race cars. Here's what she wrote. She said, we trundled down pit road. And when Paul, that was her instructor, when Paul motioned, I pressed the clutch, shifted into third, then released the clutch and stepped on the gas. A NASCAR engine is optimized for speed. So when you're puttering along at 100 miles per hour, it chugs uncomfortably. The solution is to go faster. So you get the picture. The author's driving the car at 100 miles per hour, but the engine, the car, is kind of chugging roughly, kind of like a locomotive. What's the matter with the car? Well, it doesn't feel like it's designed for speed because it can't even get to 100 miles per hour without running roughly. But that's just it. The car you see is designed for higher speed than 100 miles per hour. So the solution to a chugging NASCAR car is not to slow down, but to go faster. Because, man, that car is designed to blister the asphalt. Well, you and I know that things run best when they're used as they're designed. And you and I were designed to live fully for God. If you live halfway for God, if you live in lukewarmness, your spirit will simply not feel right your faith will burden you more than bless you. The answer is you weren't made to chug along. Go faster. You need to commit yourself and everything about you fully to the Lord. Don't be in only half way. Paul says, wake up from your slumber. And if you're going to thrive in these times we're in, be all in. And if you're not all in, repent, wake up, and get all in. And if you're awake and alive to the things of God, by all means, stay awake and stay in. We're going to look more at what Paul had to say here in Romans 13 next week and get a little more into the practical side of this. May God bless you this week. If you're watching this, and you have an interest in some things that we've said, if, if you want to take a step closer to God, if you want to wake up to the reality of God and what Jesus has for you and come into the light, come out of the darkness of doing it on your own, of living in your sin, if you want to have the hope of eternal life and want to know how, how do I 
experience this salvation, this redemption, let us know how we can help. Email us at info at northcountycfc.org. Info at northcountycfc.org. Come back next Sunday. We'll share some more things. Here's a few words before we get away this morning. May God bless you this week. Welcome back. We hope that today's message blessed you, and we hope that it continues to bless you throughout the week. If you'd like to find out more about North County Church of Christ, please reach out, drop an email. We'd love to give you any additional information um, and answer any questions you have. That's right. Have, have a, a good, good week! week.